ladies, and welcome to the season three of the Galen Hour. I welcome our viewing audience back to the season with us. Happy New Year from Galen University. I really do hope that this is a year of prosperity and we look forward to all the good things that 2022 has for all of us. We're happy to be back with season three of the Galen Hour. The Galen Hour is a production of Galen University. It focuses on academic excellence, sustainable development, and lifelong learning. We try to make it fun and interactive and certainly informative. I am Diana Gomez Perifit, and it is my pleasure to be your host for season three of the Galen Hour. Tonight we have as our guests two very um, educated, two very delightful individuals, um, Joe Awe and Don Hector Silva. I will be introducing them once we come back from our break, but I wanted to say welcome to season three of the Galen Hour. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back with our guests. I chose Galen because of its strong reputation. Great scholarships. I came because I can take all my classes online. It is what I need to take me where I want to go. To learn more about our various programs, visit our website at www.galen.edu.bz or email us at admissions at galen.edu.bz. And come soar with the Galen Eagles! Welcome back to the Galen Hour. I'd like to take this time to introduce our guests that we have on here with us tonight. We have Joe Awe. Joe is a guest tonight, but he's also going to be co-hosting along with me. Joe is, teaches social sciences. He's an adjunct lecturer at Galen University. He's one of our soaring eagles. He loves life, music, books, and is interested in people living their best lives. Welcome to the Galen Hour, Joe. Thank you. We also have with us our esteemed guest and historian, Don Hector Silva. Don Hector, in my words, is a living um, history book. He knows, uh, he has a whole wealth of information about our country. And we're really pleased to have him on air with us tonight. Don Hector is a former mayor, government minister, and senator. He hails from the Cayo district. And so it's really well fitting to have both Joe and Don Hector on with us tonight as we talk about El Cayo and Downstream. Welcome, Don Hector. Thank you very much. Uh... All right, so let's get into our show for tonight. Um, this is, as I had said earlier, season three, episode one, and we want to focus on El Cayo and Downstream. And our first segment will look at Cayo and the first leaders of the twin towns of Santa Elena and San Ignacio. Joe, I'd like to invite you to um, join me at this point with the co-hosting. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, as an eagle myself, I am excited um, to share this stage right now with um, part of the eagle organization. And also because we have a very exciting guest today who has Ms. Perfit just mentioned is a living historian, uh, a history book, that is. So, Don Hector, welcome and thank you for spending some time with us. And um, uh, this evening is going to be good. So, we have you and that's important. So, Don Hector, when Kyle was established, let us get right into it. When Kyle was established, um, or what is known as Kyle, and for the most for the most part, people in Belize, when they say Cayo, they think San Ignacio. But as um, as we well know, San, Ign um, San Ignacio is a part of Cayo. Uh, maybe the capital of the Cayo district. I don't know, but um, that is for you to tell us. Um, how did we manage ourselves earlier, earliest in the colonial time? How did we do that? Uh, are there names? Are there people? How did the colonial office? make us manage this part of the country. Can you help us with that? Yes. There are two Cayos at this moment. The Cayo district and what was known as El Cayo. But the rightful name is San Ignacio from 1870. The camp here in San Ignacio was a Bacadilla, mahogany camp. 
1842. It evolved in 1870, a Catholic priest by the name of Andrew Babastro named the camp San Ignacio. And so that's where the name begins of this town. There was no Santa Elena yet. That was a little ranch. So San Ignacio actually became San Ignacio in 1870. And thereafter, it began to evolve until in 1904. 19th of October, it was declared a tongue and the capital of the Western District. There was no Cayo District. Western District was this part of the West. Corozal Orange Walk were the Northern District. Stan Creek and Toledo was the Southern District and Belize District was the Central District. So Cayo District actually became eventually was named the Cayo District and that's a story by itself. So that's where we begin. Okay. okay. Your second question was how it evolved in that's right. administration. Administration, administratively. Yes. yes. Well, actually, in 1878, they appointed a person to be the person in charge of the district, not yet a district commissioner. It was an appointed superintendent, and it was a, actually a policeman, a senior policeman, was the one by name Mr. McManus, and he was the one that was established here to be the administrator of this district. Thereafter came the appointment of a district commissioner, and I think from there we can begin with the you know, following questions. So the district commissioner was both the commissioner for the district and he was actually the administrator of the town of San Ignacio. Okay, um, thank you. Um, are, are these Belizeans born and raised at this time or? No, they were British. Okay, so this is they important. Very good. Um, so we know that El Cayo um, is larger than a lot of people might even think, but very importantly, um, we know that we have some um, political tension with Guatemala and um, while El Cayo or San Ignacio also is a twin with Santa Elena, it also has a sister town right next to the border in, um, in Benquevejo del Carmen. What was the relationship in the colonial times uh, for Belizeans and Peteneros? What was that relationship like during the time of colonialism? Well, let us go back a little before the river came into effect, the, the actual use of the Belize World River. The trade between San Ignacio and the border, let us call it, it was actually Fayabon, was in Melchor, was that all commerce was linked between what you know as San Ignacio, linked with Benque Viejo del Carmen, and eventually into Petén by mules. Pack of mules used to carry the cargo into Petén and in return they come back loaded with chicle blocks. Uh -huh. The resin of the chic chicle. They used, yeah. So that was the big trade at the beginning. In fact, let us go a bit farther. The link between San Ignacio and Belize City was by mules. It was a three-day journey that they used to go from here, Roaring Creek, Roaring Creek, I think, to before you went to Rockville, and from there, the third day, they would be in Belize with the mules, a pack of mules. One of my grandfathers was engaged in that. But then in 1904, and that's where the ball break, in 1904, a company by the name of Mengel Lumber Company Established a train system mm -hmm. for logging next to Benque Viejo. It was a big train system 
and the remnants are still there of that train, but then they saw the need for a link with Billy City. And so the first river boat was introduced in 1904 by the Mengel Lumber Company, and that boat was the Clarence Mengel, the Clarence Mengel River Boat. That was the beginning of the link between the West and Billy City. Okay. And um so the um in as far as cultural um identities the Peten and say Benke Viejo and even San Ignacio, um I'm sure they have some relationships culturally. Um uh, let us let us imagine that um, Christianity was a big part of it and all that um Christian cultural aspect of the general culture was shared. Um, tell us about, uh, well, commerce brings development. Tell us about some of the early developments in the Kyle district, for example, or in San Ignacio, Santa Helena, and Benke. Yes. Um, actually, the, 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 the economy of the Kyle district began first by the loggers. They used to call it Mahagani Works. They were mm. there from Young Gal, then you had one at Equal Spanish Loco, then you had one in Docron, then you had one, San Ignacio was one, and Benke Viejo was a lagging camp. Right? Mm. Between, between Benke Viejo and the border, there's a place called Bacadilla. Mm. That's where they used to dump amounts of logs, both from Petén and from our side. And then when the river flooded, they were floated down to Borel Boom. That was actually the beginning of the economy of the Cayo district. Eventually, it became the economy of Belize was jump-started by these two industries here in the West. The discoverer of Chicle was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Sebastian Blancanu, Barry Boeing grandfather, in 1894. He came and he found this latex, what we call chewing gum, and they began exporting. Then the big ones came in, quite a lot of Lebanese, they migrated from Yucatan, the mm -hmm. Aues, the Espats, <laughs> they um, all migrated from Merida, and they came and settled in Benque Viejo. Some came over to San Ignacio. And they were actually the business people. Mostly they were Lebanese. There were some locals to call Mosiahs and what that. Now, that is actually when that blew up, then the West began to get amongst of mahogany contractors. Mm -hmm. Like Ben Stewart, Don Emilio Awe, Hulls, Sylvester, Marufo, and you can name them. Don so Hector, Ben Stewart yes. is my grandfather. I mean, I'm here listening, but I mean, it's just interesting that you brought up his name. Yeah. Your grandfather had two boats. Yeah. Oh, okay. Two river boats, nameless and fair. Oh, let's see, here we are. It was we go now, I, I learned about my... Mr. Gomez, yes. He was I, Ben Stewart. Mm -hmm. Ben Stewart, likewise. Yeah, he was a big mahogany contractor. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And oh, so sorry. they... They, they were the ones that built up the economy of Belize country. That time, Colossal or York, they were just planting little sugar here, and little cane here, and little oranges. But here was the bulk. This was the bulk. So much so that the Taka Airways side fit to begin a flight from Belize City down right here by the Savannah in San Ignacio every day. Taka. Monoplane, one, one, one engine plane. Wow. So, so we had the first airplane landing at the El Cayo Savannah, which is now Brasta Stadium or whatever you call. So actually, the the economy began to boil because of these two industries. I find it very interesting the mix of the mix of ethnicity and cultures in the Cayo district. So, since Joe had asked, if I could just spin off a quick question of his um, original question. Um, why would why did the um, the hours the spats um, the Lebanese if I'm not mistaken uh, yes. people come from the um, Yucatan 
all the way to banking. It's interesting, and it's not people yes. necessarily from the Guatemala coming um, up to or um, kind no. of street. No, the workers, the laborers, the chicleros actually came from Petén. Some came also from the north, from when the Cast War in 1847. There was a big migration that came and settled Bullet Tree, San Jose Socos, Benque Viejo. So these were the laborers that came here. Hence the reason why the village of San Ignacio was named or rather the mahogany war was named San Ignacio. Because the majority of people there, they were workers, they were laborers, mahogany cutters and, and chicle bleeders and everything. So the migration actually came from many angles. Petén, Yucatan, and of course, Billy City, and a large section of Mosquito Indians. People do not know this. A lot of Mosquito Indians settled between Santa Elena and Roaring Creek. Black Manady, Ticket, all those were settled by Mosquito Indians. We used to call them Wikers, no? but that was the, 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 the population that began to build. Yeah, oh, interesting. Don Hector, I, I just want you to do a, a quick little review here. Um, we have we have seen the growth of the industry of storekeepers and stores in San Ignacio and Santa Elena, even in Benke. And uh, the large population of those stores are managed by, are owned by Chinese. Um, looking at the colonial period, um, were there Chinese here or these are new Chinese and Taiwanese and um, um, the Asians that are, are now here in the Cayo district, for example? Very good question. Very good and appropriate question at this moment. You know, the, the, the merchant community of both Benque Viejo and San Ignacio was made, made up of mostly what you call locals. Because the, the Arabs that came here eventually, their children grew and, and, and they began. So the, the commerce here was actually operated or run by locals. People, what I would call local people that were born here, grew here. And so... Uh, I, when I served as a mayor, three terms, I had a lot of application by foreign merchants. I did not discriminate, but I said, until our local merchants cannot give the service, we will not accept any other. San Ignacio had about 20 odd local stores run by people here locally. Mm -hmm. I did not allow that to be changed. I invited light industries from anybody that came from wherever. But now we see the position that we only have one local person with a store in San Ignacio, mm -hmm. Juan Chuk, Mr. Juan Chuk. All the local store owners disappeared, they closed them. It's something to think about very seriously, but of course that's another another discussion no? yes so this is very interesting and i i am um, happy to hear of the makeup and the um people of cayo a very beautiful um district and the people of cayo are also very beautiful as well but so now we have a better understanding of um the mixtures that help to make cayo and we do want to take a quick break and when we come back we will come back with your second segment and we will look at We'll finish this conversation, but we'll also look at all of the villages between Cayo and Belmopan and how those villages came about and how they got their names. So we'll take a short Very break good. and we'll be right back with the Galen Hour. The Galen Eagle Podcast, every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Catch us live on Galen University's Facebook page, YouTube channel, and select radio stations. Our, we're having a very interesting and informative conversation with Joe Awe and Don Hector Silva tonight on the Galen Hour. So this second segment, we would like to talk about more about Kaya, of course, about, about the river, 
the rivers and also all of the villages between Cayo and or San Ignacio rather and Belmopan. So um, I invite Joe to take up um, the hosting at this point. Joe. Good evening again. Um, it is it is it has been great so far um, to get Don Hector to give us that type of information that in many instances are missing in the books that have been written before historically um i think as a lover of history myself i like to connect uh, moments with humanity so i like to hear about people and we never know who it's going to touch because it's oh it's my great great grandfather you know mm -hmm. and don hector has that kind of touch and 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 um, intellect to bring that into life so I think that it is important that people from Cayo and of course from around the world uh, who will see this or listen to this will um, will re recognize that before anything there was um, for transportation from here to Belize City from, from San Ignacio to Belize City <laughs> there was no road so how did we get there and Don Hector earlier said, well, they used to go by mule for a three-day um, for a three-day trip. I would love to do that myself. But um, but before that, there was another way to transport anything, and including communication and transportation of um, for Don Hector. Um, we have heard that there were these beautiful um, boats that were the bus lines so to speak between san ignacio and belize city i would like you to expand on that for us a little bit please good i have here the names of all the boats i have the names i think diane asked me a question about the villages between here and belmopan so let us deal with that so that we can know the reason why those boats were so important river boats okay. and let us go now for example at here is okay the 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 the, the villages between san ignacio and belmopan Calid rolling creek at that time began at branch mouth Branch Mouth is the river whereby three rivers meet. The Mopan, the Makal, to form the Belize Old River. That is the first village. From there, we went down from Branch Mouth and we got to a place named Bright Lookout. Hmm. Then Johnny Sam. That's when I was a little boy. I used to go every day to go play football at Johnny Sam next to our property. Today it is now Santa Familia. The whole area is Santa Familia. Mm -hmm. From there, you went down to our ranch, Carmelita. Today is a thriving retiree camp, I mean, a place, Carmelita Gardens. But it was our farm, Carmelita. Then you went down to Bradley's Bank. Another family, Bradley's, had their farm there. Then you went down to another place named Caratella Bank. Remember the word bank? Mm -hmm. That word bank kept coming out because they were by the river bank. From Caratella Bank, you got to Docron. Docron was a very famous place. That's where I was born when it was a town. It's no longer. Docron had children factory rum factory coffin for the dead for whole of the beliefs and what that, that was belong to don emilio Awe. from docron you go to santa rosa for the agas family from there you went to sawmill which was another place where don jorge's part had a big sawmill so they named the place sawmill then you had middle bank and esperanza Two names in one village belong to a gentleman by name Mr. Emiliano Armstrong. From there, you went down to um, Benkeseva. That's where the Hopuns they were born. It was another village by the river. Benke Seiba. Mm -hmm. Benke means bank. Then you had Tiger Bank. 
That's why the Bedrans have right now the tiger, tiger run um, meat Farm. processing plant. It was tiger run. That's where they were going to uh, um, host 400 Jewish family during World War II. Mm -hmm. They built the homes, but the Jew people never did come. They went to the States. Then you had baking pot, very famous Creole tongue. Like how you have Gales Point, you had baking pot made up of mostly what you call um, descendants of slaves. Huh? Then you had Garbot Creek, where you all are right now. Galen is at Garbot Creek. Yeah. Why Garbot? There was a logging operator named Garbot that used to take um, logs here. So you have Garbot Falls in Benke Viejo, our borderline monument, and you had Garbot Creek tied to that same individual. Mm -hmm. Then you had Spanish Lookout, very important in our history. Spanish Lookout is where the Spaniards from Mexico encounter a, 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 a contingent and they kept watching each other to see who was going to make the move. Imagine, <laughs> eventually in June, the rains came and the Spaniards, they went away with their general name, Melchor de Mencos. Oh, wow. General Melchor de Mencos was stationed at Spanish Loco on an attempt to invade, oh? but they were driven away, so they went. Then that is Spanish Loco. So I told the Mennonites when I addressed them the last time. Then you had, for example, Morning Glory wow. as another farm, a big farm for Don Eduardo Juan. Right next to Galen University, that farm is called Morning Glory. Then you had Platon, another place by the river. Then you had Gentle Bank. Then you had Floral Park for the Burns. Mm -hmm. Bosman Arnold eventually bought it. Then you had Barton Creek. Very famous creek where they used to mine gold away at the sources, but that's another story. Then you had Little Barton Creek, today Unitedville. We baptized that place as Unitedville, but it was Little Barton Creek. Then you had Iguana Creek, another settlement farther down. Then you had Bukut Palace. Bukut Palace is a little village, a mosquito village, as you go down Mount Hope from San Ignacio, on your left, that little area there, I think had Mama has something around there. That little area was Bukut Palace. From the Bukut Palace, you go to Black Man Eddy. Aha. This is important. Who was Mr. Blackman? Mr. Blackman was a white Englishman who drowned in the river when he attempted to cross that eddy, eddy is a, is a war, war, war pool, you know, in, in the river. He attempted to cross that with his boots on. So he drowned in that eddy, and the place was called Black Man Eddy, the pool. And so the village became Black Man Eddy. Then you have Wari Head. Wari Head is where actually Dan Davis used to have a big farm. I think Johnny Sorrell has a hotel or something like that there. That was Wari Head. We changed it through a Canadian missionary, Mr. Mel Holland. He asked permission to change it to Ontario. So that is the Ontario. And then you go down to Tea Kettle. Tea Kettle. Then as you leave Tea Kettle, well, you are not Tea Kettle, that famous curve there. Why Tea Kettle? Well, I tried to inquire when I was representative, and they told me that they found an old settlement there when the people started to come up. They found an old settlement with some old kettles, you know, people abandoned the place. And so there was a ticket. That's what the abortion is. From ticket, you come to a very important place named Young Gal. <laughs> Young Gal was what is one of the oldest mahogany works in the country, along with Motomaro and other mahogany works, Young Gyal. From Young Gyal, you go down to Banabank. We are the banners. 
were well established, the family banners, no? And from there, from Banner, you go into more or less, uh, there was a place named New Home. And from there, you get to Roaring Creek, Roaring Creek. They used to call it Beherano Bank. But today it's Roaring Creek because of the roar that the thousand foot fall creates when it comes down and passes through Roaring Creek. All the water from the 1,600 foot fall runs down and empties into the Roaring Creek. From there, you go to famous Banana Bank from Melado. Banana Bank was a famous cattle ranch for the Melado family, millionaires. And so Banana Bank is still established there, Mr. Gentleman is there. Then you have Ben Stewart, never delay, a very large farm. And that's where some of our best horses they came, like Blue Gong, Bring the Money, and famous horses that people used to buy from Mr. Ben Stewart. And there you go down the line, but uh, we will go into another, another territory like Cocos, Meditation, and um, Motomaro, and all that. So I leave you all with that. That is the settlement that was there that this 26 river boats used to service along with San Ignacio, Petén, and of course, uh, go ahead, Joe. Wow. Yes, so. Oh, okay. um, the boats you want yes uh, we'll get to that right now the villages but um sorry the boats but um diana i think that if you try to get that horse bring the money from your great grandfather you're gonna be in good <laughs> i know man this is rich history i mean lots of what don hector is saying i've never heard before i mean we live i've lived all my life in belize and lived in Cayo district and we know so little about the Cayo district and to top it off my great grandfather has his some of his wealth and beginnings come from out of the Cayo district as well so this is really such good history don hector we're so happy that you're here with us tonight don hector did you ride in one of those boats did you get a chance or were you too young or when well, yes, was the last okay. boat? when was the I last a, boat i had a bad to take so I had to go to Belize City. There was no dentist in Cairo. My dad took me there, 1947. And uh, it was rough. It's about three, four days journey. You carry your own lunch. And there was outhouses along the way that you start to do whatever. They used to have it well organized, you know. And so you go there on that boat and uh, you sleep in a hammock if you take one. And, and it was pretty exciting because you saw so much things on the river side. On. You saw iguanas there, you saw gibnats drinking water, you see one mountain called down below and the tapir, I mean. So it was quite interesting. On the way back, likewise, even longer. And uh, so it was, it, was, it was fun, I would say, especially for young people, you know, because you see things that you didn't expect. Then you go to Belize City and you go to your dentist. Just quickly, Joe, I know you've done tour guiding in your yeah. lifetime. Yeah. And I'm wondering, when our tour bus go south, sorry, go west and travel that beautiful western um, highway, um, the George Price Highway, do we ever tell this type of a story and narrative as we pass all of the villages heading from Belmopan to San Ignacio? That's a very good question. I am sure that there has been some research on just the large or the seven or eight villages starting at Roaring Creek to San Ignacio. But this kind of information here has not been put in a book. And I am thinking Don Hector needs to do that if he hasn't done it yet. Because just between San Ignacio, where we are, and Galen University, just at Central Farm, he mentions about 10 different communities that live, that, that actually work the land and we don't have that information. So no, we are, we are cheating um, um, people from the true history of the development of the area. So Certainly this not. is a very important um, uh, information, informative space right now. I agree completely. This is a lot of missing information that we need to know as a people. We need to be more informed about our beautiful country. 
Um, we take a lot for granted. All those very colorful names. I mean, everything has a meaning and a reason why the villages were given the name. We had a Bokut Palace. Never heard of that one before. Um, <laughs> thank you, Don Hector. This is really, really very in, um, informative and enjoyable. Don Hector, if I can direct this at you, I don't want to keep you back. I think we don't have a lot of time left, but um, the boats, you have all the names of them, I know. But addition to that, can you also tell us how they were managed? Were, was the town council, uh, was there a, a, an association? How did, how did it work? Uh, actually, the boats, they were owned by business people. For example, let us take the first two boats that came to San Ignacio that were commissioned to come from Belicity to San Ignacio were owned by Miss by the Clarence Mengel Lumber Company. Their names were the Clarence Mengel, then the Cruiser, C R U I Z E R, Cruiser, two first boats. Mm -hmm. Then came from people named Mr. David Smith and John Buckley brought in the third boat named the Cutter, C U T T E R. Then followed. Mr. Aaron Arnold, Bosman Daddy, Bosman. Mm -hmm. home with the boat he named the Zebu. Zebu is a breed of cattle, no? So he named his because he had a big farm. Then followed the Mr. Henry Lisby, another chicle contractor. He named his boat the Chicle. Then came Habet and Sabala. Habet is Papi Habet's grandfather, no? Um, mm -hmm. They own and they named their boat the Cacique. Cacique is like a boss, or a chief. Mm -hmm. Then Don Emilio Awe came and he built a boat. The biggest boat was Coloso, owned by Don Emilio Awe. Then followed Habet and Sabala again, a company, a chicle contracting company, named their boat the Cayo. Then came Mr. Eduardo Sabala, who had a big store on Queen Street there. He named his boat after his wife, Doña Elenita. The boat was Elenita. Melado had some of the biggest boats, also the Apollo and the Minerva. Then the Dutz was owned by Mr. Guy Nord. He owned Butch, the Dutz and the Buddha. Mm -hmm. Then the Gomez brothers had the Nameless and the Tireless Gomez brothers. Mm -hmm. Then Mr. Ed John Osha had the Creole, a boat named Creole. Then you had Mr. Eddie Osha had the Amy after his wife. Then Mr. Walter Burns had the Olga, I think after some relative. Then the William Wiley, I think the grandfather of the former commissioner of police, had the Quetzal. Mm -hmm. That's a Guatemalan tainted name there, not the Quetzal. Mm -hmm. Then the Catholic mission had a boat named San Ignacio. That used to do mostly like schools and uh, nuns and they used to travel there. And then Mr. Gaynard had two more boats named the Schulz and the Empress. 26 boats and the Mendes, the family had the Rene B. That's Eduardo Mendes' uh, father. Mm -hmm. And so we had about 26 to 28 boats that used to carry. Okay, these boats used to come with cargo from Belize. Different kind of cargo. The dock here by San Ignacio, but a place is still there, El Cayo Landing. And from there, the mules would pick up all those cargoes destined to Benque Viejo, Pete Evel Melchor, Fayabon at that time, and then into Peten. And then Peten is to distribute the tongues around like Santo Toribio. And, and, and. So Belize used to supply Peten. So that matter of that claim is killed by these boats. Yeah. A cart road was not built, but the river 
the existing river was used for the development of it. And I have been arguing that, but well, that's politics right now, so I'm not going to that. But actually, the river, this river trade killed the Article 7 of that claim. Mm -hmm. so that's that's oh, that, on the that, way. Yes. Yeah, on the way back, on the way back, after the discharge, then came the hundreds and thousands of blocks of chicle that were taken down by this and cattle and other products to Belize City and then for the export market. Wow. Um, Don Hector, obviously, um, we are just touching a part of the knowledge that you have. And obviously, in one show, we cannot make that happen at all. I think we need a you know, 100 shows to get this done. But you touched on a very important thing, the, the Anglo-Guatemalan dispute, which we have inherited. That's maybe for another time from your version of the politics. Um, but one last question um, in this area. Um, the regulations that, you know, for example, today when you want to be a tour operator for tours in Belize, you need to go through a regulatory system. Were there regulatory systems during the time or just, it was just to get a license to run the boats and that's it? Well, I'll tell you what, in my opinion, in those days, there was more a decentralized administration. In other words, the district commissioner was empowered, for example, I mentioned it yesterday in one of the TV shows, the district commissioner was empowered to give you your board certificate. You didn't have to go to Belize City nor Belmopan. You get it right here, your board certificate. You get your passport right here in San Ignacio. You don't wow. have to go and get line, catch a line to see the radio. You get it right here, the district commissioner. So the district commissioner was empowered with certain executive powers and administrative powers to deal with matters uh, um, belonging to this to the area here so that people were were, were, were were saved all that time to go on down to Belize City or Belmopan today, catch a line there and wait. Even land department, land titles. We, I was the chairman of the ad hoc committee for lands and I was empowered by the minister of lands to be able to vet along with the public officers. The district commissioner was a member of my group the chief agricultural officer, Mr. Gazman Ellis, the chief surveyor, Mr. Joe Langle, my colleague, Santiago Perdomo. It was a group of us that dealt with land application. You didn't have to go and stand up the Belmopan in front of 200 people or 300 people. You were dealt with right in the district. So the administration, as you said, I found it easier in those days to get to get an answer to problem like health department and the, we had a health officer here, a full health officer, a labor, the labor commissioner, everything that was here. So we found it in Cairo easier, for example, to get permits. Mm -hmm. um, you want to get a license, you get it here. You want to, to, to establish something, you get it right here. No, we didn't have to go and then beg for favors. But it was mm -hmm. done here. So I think it, the administration was easier. Even the term when I was mayor, I served mayor three terms. And to me, there was no problem in people uh, applying, you know, applying for a piece of land in the town here or, or, or a license to operate. All the people said, oh, I want a license for both one. Lee Chapter, Santa Elena, Shulman, Salita, Aragon, yeah, they let her there authorizing them. And they go and establish their shop. No kind of red tape and consume it tomorrow and the day after and no. It was quite good. I I, I enjoyed my my, my, my long term of service in the Cayo district. Yes. Um the Hector always a rebel with a cause and that is important. You have yes. not lost your energy for how, how young are you now? Oh Keep man I have, a, I have about 12, 12 more years to go with full steam. <laughs> oh, I am now eight, eight young very oh, nice. man i am i am i am i am impressed and i am 
excited because now I want to really live my life like you. Um, Mr. Drink Diana, carrot juice. Drink a lot of carrot juice. Okay. Carrot juice. Carrot juice. Yes. <laughs> Diana, um, one one thing I, I think that another another um, show can be done with Don Hector Definitely. starting at 1949. No, yes. that is where it's going to be very, it's going to be lit, as the young young people say today, because 1949 is a very stormy time in Belize, and oh, yes. the 31st of December 1949 changed Belize once and for all. Yeah, so, definitely. Yes, right. so I agree with you, Joe. Um, we have not touched even the tip of the knowledge and information that Don Hector has that he can offer and share with our people. And um, this has been so interesting. Um, we've only done San Ignacio to Rowing Creek, really. And so Don Hector, we are hoping that this becomes the first in a series of um, shows that talk about our different districts. We certainly want to talk about um, Belmopan City and move from then Belmopan to, to the Belize district. And um, so we're looking forward to having you come back on this show and and continue the series. It is really fantastic information. I don't know why this information isn't being taught in our schools, but I hope this is the beginning of that pitch and advocating for that to happen. But Don Hector, you have to write the books, man. I have them written already just to be published. I have them published. 21 books but you know it'll touch a very important thing the knowledge that young people deserve at this time of their country for example the belmopan story you will find it very interesting how belmopan came to be is totally different from what people have been told because i was there i was one of the architects from the beginning and so um, when that time comes, no, you are welcome, you know, just give me a shot. It oils my brains. All these yes. discussions oil helps to oil my brains, to lubricate it so that I don't lose it. Great. So, <laughs> so we're telling you, Don Hector, we want you back Good. for our next episode. Um, and we want to pick up where we are. We've left, we're leaving off today. And as Joseph, 1949. Yes. Um, we want to pick up at that point and talk a bit more about still Kaya district but or or um capital yes the Lohan city so um i want to take a quick quick break and we'll be right back with our final words the covid 19 vaccination helps us to protect the most vulnerable our choice to get vaccinated affects others it is a moral responsibility and an act of love for the entire community. My name is Dorian Barrow. I am the Dean of the Faculty of Education at Yale University. My name is Melanie Osher Danilchek. I am the Administrative Assistant to the Office of the Provost at Galen University. My name is Sherry Gibbs. I'm the Dean for the Faculty of Art, Science and Technology at Galen University. My name is Dr. Eve Aird and I am the Provost of Galen University. I got vaccinated because my family, my colleagues, and my students. Because I trust the science, but because I also want to protect myself, my family, my colleagues, students, and the community so that we can get out of this pandemic and get back to our lives. I did it for my Galen family, my family at home, and I did it for you, please. I got vaccinated for my husband, for my children, for my grandsons. I got vaccinated for Galen University, for my colleagues, for my students. I got vaccinated for Belize, for you. Get vaxxed. Wear your mask. Wash your hands and watch your distance. Welcome back to the Galen Hour. This has been a most interesting episode. It is certainly the way you start a show. Um, so we are happy to have Don Hector Silva and Joe Arbor with us tonight on the first episode of season three of the Galen Hour. Unfortunately, we are in our wrap-up se segment. It's really uh, just a few minutes we have left to wrap up, but we do know that we're coming back next week with a follow-up episode to tonight's 
um, show. So, Joe and Don Hector, I invite you to give your final words. I, I want to salute Galen University for this step that they have taken. This step is long overdue when our people deserve to be told what they are worth, where we come from. That has never been told before, and I am a living witness to that. So, Joe, Diane, and the, the, the team here, you are, are doing a historical step in the right direction. From here onward, I believe that Belicians will get a better grasp of what their country is, where it came from. And of course, it gives us that lead for a forward look for a better belief. We came from, we struggled, and we are here. And 1949, as Joe requests, will be an important piece of discussion when we begin 1949. Thank you very much for your invite, and I am here at your call. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Don Hector. We are absolutely um, grateful for your time and certainly for the knowledge. Um, we are doing this on behalf of Galen University, which is the storehouse of information and their job is to, or our job is to disseminate this information to help build this country further. But most importantly, this series is uh, more important because we are seeing, in my opinion, people trying to build a foundation on top of another foundation that's already there. And the reason they're trying to do it is because they don't know how that first foundation historically uh, was built and that it's there. It's just a matter of learning what happened, uh, the injections of historics, the injection of the economy, so, um, socially, um, politically, all this mix that we have here in, in, in the Belizean Foundation, and then we build on top of that. So your injection into this entire Belize uh, building Belize is necessary. And in fact, we are very grateful that you are still here with us and telling us this has been done already. Build on this. I am happy to join you tonight and the team. I think that this is a, a great step forward historically and also for all of the development of Belize. So I am very grateful to be here myself. Um, Diana, thank you for the inv invitation. Don Hector, thank you for coming. And the team, Ashley and, and um, James. And James. So <laughs> thank you very much for your time today. And thank you to Joe and Don Hector. This has been a very enlightening, um, enlightening sorry, episode. Um, our history is not something that should just be left in the books. We need to bring it to life. Tonight's show and this season and all of our Galen, our seasons really um, promotes what Galen University promotes, which is academic excellence, sustainable development, and lifelong learning. At Galen University, we invite our nation to come soar with us. We believe in higher education and we promote excellence always. Thank you for joining us here tonight for our season three, episode one of the Galen Hour. See you here next week, same time, same hour. Good night. On the lovely